like most of you, the only reason I'm here is because I couldn't get into Judge Napolitano's lecture. <laughs> so, you know, welcome to the remedial class. Um, it, seriously, thank you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I have to say I'm extremely grateful to the Mises Institute uh, for inviting me here. Uh, I know you probably hear a lot of these sorts of stories throughout this week, um, but I'm going to tell you mine as well. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day, and I realized that it's been uh, 11 years since I attended my first Mises University. Uh, and for me, that was a, a really transformative experience. Uh, I was an undergrad at the time, and I didn't really have a, a clear idea of what I wanted to do with my career. Uh, but being here for this week and getting to listen to people like Joe Salerno and Peter Klein and Guido Holzman talk about these ideas uh, instantly let me know uh, what I wanted to do uh, with my career. So I have to say I'm, I'm very uh, humbled and, and honored and grateful for the Mises Institute for uh, inviting me back here to, to contribute to this program um, that, uh, that had such a, a big impact on me. Um, now today, uh, to talk about the economics of war, I want to start uh, just by observing that uh, if you've looked at a previous Mises University schedule or if you've been to a previous Mises University, you might know that uh, there was a version of this talk that used to be given by Robert Higgs. And uh, if you know anything about uh, Higgs and his work, um, and if you don't, I, I highly, highly commend it to you. Um, but if you know anything about Higgs, you'll know that he's basically forgotten more about this topic than most of us will ever know. Um, he's a, he, uh, he's a, just a tremendous scholar. And so I would, uh, very big shoes to fill if I were trying to, to simply do um, what he did. Uh, likewise, uh, another version of this talk has been given uh, a few more years past by the, uh, the late Ralph Rako, who used to lecture on the topic of war and liberalism. Um, and once again, if... Uh, if you don't know of those lectures, I, I really encourage you to look them up because he was also a tremendous scholar. Um, he was just a great historian, and I'm sure he'd be you know, totally horrified that I'm uh, being allowed to give this talk in his place. <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, rather than try to sort of repeat previous performances, I wanted to try to take a sort of a, a new approach to this um, and talk about a few slightly different topics than, than uh, other lecturers have uh, discussed before at Mises University. And basically what I hope to do is, uh, by doing that, is uh, tell you something new. Um, and if you're very lucky, I might even tell you something that you find interesting. So um, basically what we're doing here today is to talk about some of the ways that economics sheds light on war and on the process of war making. Um, in other words, sort of how we make sense of war using economic reasoning or methods that are similar to economics. Uh, and economics, as we will discover, um, it can tell us, uh, it can help us answer a wide range of questions about things like uh, what makes war unique as a human activity, uh, why wars happen, what motivates them, how they're prosecuted, um, and uh, sometimes how they end, right? Um, but just in general, how war making might fit within a sort of a broader framework uh, for thinking about human action, right? Um, also, I'll say at the start that I do sometimes tend to go over time in my lectures, um, but you don't need to worry about that. Um, you just have to take a shorter break, that's all. <laughs> um, anyway, um, as a preamble to this, I want to um, say something about where this topic fits, again, within uh, Austrian economics generally and within sort of a system of maybe praxeology. And to do that, I will recall this comment from Mises. Uh, this one's from Human Action, uh, but you can find many similar comments scattered throughout his work and the work of other Austrian economists as well. And uh, Mises says that economics, until, at least until now, has been the best developed part uh, of praxeology. And uh, this sort of uh, invites a very obvious question, that is, well, what are the other branches uh, of praxeology? What might those look like? Um, sometimes when people talk about uh, the, the praxeological method, uh, they tend to confuse those two things and uh, sort of imply that uh, uh, economics, uh, praxeology is economics, and economics just is praxeology, um, but rather, um, uh, as Mises and others have explained, economics is really just one branch of this much broader system um, for thinking uh, about uh, human action. Um, so, yeah, we have this uh, important question, what are the other branches, um, and then how would sort of war fit within, uh, within this, uh, this framework? And so one way to answer this is to look at uh, a schema that was proposed uh, by, uh, by Rothbard in an article he published in the American Economic Review. Um, and here he outlines a number of different fields uh, and subfields within the logic of action, uh, which includes economics. And he starts with uh, the theory of the isolated individual, which you've heard about already, I think, this week, um, and then goes on to uh, sort of economics proper, sort of the, the theory of exchange. Um, and if you look at this, you can see that, you know, as Mises said, 
Um, economics really is the best developed branch of praxeology so far. Um, it's very easy to look at this and see, you know, so the different fields and subfields and so on. Okay? Um, however, what's uh, it's important if you were to look at uh, right here on the 2B, um, effects of violent intervention in the market, that's going to be where war primarily comes into economic analysis, right? Um, which makes sense because war, of course, involves a sort of a violent intervention uh, in the market, um, both uh, uh, through the actual physical conflict, but also through domestic economic policies. That's going to be a major theme uh, in the discussion today. Okay. Um, and so this is where uh, Mises, for example, would place the analysis of war. Um, and if, for instance, if you actually look at human action, Mises has a, a dedicated chapter uh, on the economics of war. And that appears in the final section of the book, which is on uh, the hampered market economy. Right? So that's how he thought of it. Um, but in addition to this, um, there, you can also think of uh, sort of a theory of war as an independent topic within praxeology. Um, and this is what Rothbard points out here. Uh, you can think of war and war making as an, an object of study that's maybe that's somewhat independent of economics as well, um, as well as falling under the, the theory of intervention. Okay. Uh, there's also the theory of games, which is important to bring up here. Uh, Lucas Engelhardt has talked about this at Mises University before, so if you're interested, you can look at his uh, previous lectures. If you studied some economics at the university level, probably you've been exposed to at least some game theory already. Um, anyway, so you kind of know what this is about. And I mention it here just because uh, game theory is often used to model conflict situations uh, and war making and things like that. Um, I'm not going to talk about it too much, just to, to point out that uh, uh, in the theory of war, game theory often uh, runs into some of the same problems that it runs into when it's applied to economics, namely um, that it, you can involve, uh, uh, find yourself making some very unrealistic assumptions about the way that people behave. Um, uh, and in addition to that, you, you end up sort of modeling what are really very complex, uncertain situations in a very mechanistic kind of way. Right? Um, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, and then finally, there's sort of uh, the great unknown uh, in praxeology here as well. Um, so this list, uh, it's not necessarily exhaustive. Um, well, actually, I guess in a way it is, because Rothbard throws unknown in there, right? And that could mean anything. Um, but uh, this is just uh, one way to think about it. But I think it's a, a useful schema for breaking down some of the, the major parts of the investigation. Um, and I hope to, to uh, uh, draw on both um, the uh, uh, war as a uh, part of uh, the analysis of interventionism and also war as a sort of a distinct category uh, of investigation by itself, right? Um, but I guess basically, when you're thinking about this topic um, and how to sort of categorize war in the study of human action, uh, the basic question that you have to answer is uh, to be or not to be. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'll have you know that this entire lecture is uh, structured around that one god awful pun. Okay. But the point is, uh, Mises and Rothbard and many other Austrians have acknowledged uh, that there are all these different topics that we can uh, use, uh, you know, the, uh, in which we can use uh, uh, praxeology. We can bring it to bear um, to uh, discuss some of these uh, some of these issues. Okay. okay. So there are a few big uh, questions uh, that we could ask. Uh, what is war? Where does it come from? Is it inevitable? And things like that. So probably best to start by just talking about uh, what war is uh, from a, in a sort of a social science context. And the first point here um, is that a war isn't really a sort of a narrow praxeological concept. It's more of a historical, maybe an anthropological idea. It's just that we use economics to make sense of it. Right? And uh, it does have a few vital characteristics, though, that social scientists and economists in particular can be interested in. And the first one is that a war is purposeful. Right? It's important to uh, bring this point to the, to the front right from the beginning, because for a lot of human history, wars have been regarded as somehow uh, beyond human control, right? As, uh, uh, as maybe inevitable. Uh, be, and of course, they did have purposes, but oftentimes those purposes were concealed, especially by the people who were making the wars, right? But it's, it's vital to understand that uh, war does have purpose, and it is engaged in intentionally um, on the part of at least one of any participating belligerents, right? Um, and so 
that immediately lets you see how this fits into a framework of human action, right? Because that's what action is. It's purposeful behavior. So once we understand that wars are motivated by, uh, are uh, prosecuted because of human purposes, we start to see where this fits uh, in sort of social science more broadly, right? Uh, second, or, oh, we'll cut back here. Uh, second, uh, the idea of organization, right? Um, Again, wars uh, don't occur sort of uh, randomly. They are the result of a plan. Um, they are a result of deliberate planning um, and the deliberate use and coordination of scarce human and physical resources. Right? Someone somewhere has to organize a conflict um, if it is to become a, a true war. Right? Uh, Obviously, the most uh, common example of this would be simply mobilizing the armed forces, right? That requires tremendous human resources um, and also scarce physical resources in order to, uh, to uh, support the war-making effort, right? Somebody somewhere has to do this organizing. Right? And then the third point um, is maybe the most important one, and that relates to the state, right? Now, it is important to note that uh, mo warfare in the modern era is not unique to states, right? War can exist without, uh, without a state, strictly speaking. Um, however, uh, wars do actually, uh, states do have a very sort of special relationship uh, uh, with wars. And what I mean by that is that um, wars require, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, resources in order to, to prosecute. They require large-scale organizational efforts, um, usually much larger than what's going on in the, in the private sector uh, at, the, at the time. And usually all this organization occurs without the consent of at least some of the people who are being organized and certainly without the consent of the people um, who are being targeted in this war. And so historically, um, the only uh, sort of uh, agent um, that's capable of doing that is something like a state. Um, and you even have um, their sociologists, people like Charles Tilley, who argued that the modern state actually emerged when uh, rulers were looking for ways to finance increasingly expensive military adventures. So one very effective way to do that, so they discovered, uh, was to establish this sort of uh, legal monopoly over the ability to levy taxes over a, a certain area which they controlled, so as to create a steady stream of income that could then be used for things like war finance. Okay? Um, but in any case, it's been recognized since antiquity that states have this special relationship with warfare because war is simply uh, the ultimate tool at a state's disposal for both defending itself from other states and for increasing its own influence um, through aggressive war making, right? Um, maybe you know the, the famous line from Karl von Clausewitz that war is the continuation of politics by other means. Uh, that's the sort of sentiment that we're talking about here. Um, or in another way, uh, Sun Tzu summed it up quite well. Uh, warfare is the greatest affair of state, the basis of life and death, the Tao to survival or extinction of the state. Right? Now, um, to talk about the economic causes of war, uh, Mises in particular, I think, was very insightful about this issue. Um, he recognized that although each war has you know, its own individual causes in some sense, in the modern era, at least, there were some definite trends um, in terms of the causes of war. And Mises um, is very uh, uh, emphatic um, about looking at ideology in particular um, as, a, as a cause of conflict and of war making, right? So for Mises, the central question about war is an economic one, and that is, will nations embrace uh, a philosophy uh, of autarky, that is of, of economic self-sufficiency, or will they embrace the international division of labor? Right? So as the, the classical liberals had argued, uh, the international div division of labor is absolutely vital uh, for ensuring peace. Um, and in fact, peace and free trade mutually reinforce each other. Right? Um, and in fact, extending the international division of labor can even be a very powerful check uh, on war because uh, the more specialized people in different regions become, uh, the, more, uh, the more they grow to depend on each other. Uh, and therefore, um, the more vulnerable they are to disruptions in their market activities, right? Um, so the, the more reason they have to cooperate with each other peacefully. Um, so with that in mind, you know, the more people that real, realize that they are mutually dependent on each other, uh, the more they attempt to extend these sorts of peaceful relations to as many corners of the world as they possibly can, to bring as many people as possible uh, within the scope of the international division of labor. Uh, but war, on the other hand, is, uh, uh, is 
rooted in uh, essentially the the rejection of the idea uh, uh, the ideals of uh, of laissez faire and laissez passer that the the classical liberals accepted. So rather than the Misesian law of association, which you've heard about already this week, which explains how everybody benefits um, from peaceful exchange. Um, the philosophy and the policy of autarky um, are based on the idea that uh, group interests are inevitably going to conflict with each other. Right? Um, and it's this sort of uh, uh, zero-sum uh, mercantilist type thinking uh, that underlies protectionist policies of all different sorts. And it's protectionism, actually, uh, that and, and, and the regulation of trade, the disruption of the international division of labor, those are the things um, that actually create conflict uh, both domestically and internationally, um, by creating winners and losers in the marketplace. Right? So on an international scale, the goal of protectionist public policy is to uh, make domestic producers winners by imposing tariffs and other kinds of regulations, um, and to make basically everybody else, but especially foreign producers, the losers. That's what protectionism does. That's what its purpose is, right? So unsurprisingly, this is going to create some hostility between the winners and the losers, especially when uh, foreign producers and, and foreign workers who are the losers from this process, um, in particular, uh, when their lives are destroyed, as they routinely are uh, by protectionism, right? So in this way, domestic interventionism, domestic economic policy, tends to breed international tension. Um, and if that tension is allowed to foment sufficiently, um, eventually it can spill over and become an actual military conflict. Right? Um, Mises argues uh, that this is exactly what was occurring uh, prior to uh, both of the, uh, uh, the world wars in the 20th century, um, and in particular, the, the Second World War. Um, as a side note, I'll also mention that protectionism, it doesn't just cause international strife, but also domestic strife as well, because it creates a conflict between uh, privileged and non-privileged groups within uh, a nation state. And it's important to, uh, to think of this, too, because this is uh, particularly relevant for the study of imperialism. Um, uh, as you know, if you may have studied uh, some uh, recent history, um, imperialist conflicts are often used as a way to sort of distract from domestic economic strife uh, by finding, or in some cases, inventing sort of foreign enemies um, uh, against whom wars can be waged um, as a way to distract uh, from the problems of economic policy at home. Right? Um, but that's just a side note. Um, in general, um, what we're talking, what Mises is explaining here, is how um, the consistent application of uh, illiberal and, and anti-market ideology um, can lead to war. And for him, especially in the 20th century, this was sort of the, the key to understanding international conflict. But the main point is that interventionism, even at home, um, can lead to conflict internationally. Um, and Mises puts it quite nicely here, uh, economic nationalism, the necessary complement of domestic interventionism, hurts the interests of foreign peoples and thus creates international conflict. So, um, Whatever their purposes might be, um, eventually wars are going to uh, break out. And when that happens, uh, war sets in motion a whole chain of, of uh, economic events um, that have a pretty profound effect on society. So the first one um, that we want to talk about is uh, the problem of war finance. I mentioned before that wars are extremely expensive and that one of the oldest problems in politics is, is finding uh, sufficient means to wage war. Um, you know, even in ancient history, uh, wars required mobilizing resources on a scale that was, that was much larger um, than anything uh, that was going on outside the, the political sphere at the time. Um, but governments finance their uh, finance wars in the same way they finance basically all of their expenditures through a combination of taxation, borrowing, and inflation. These are the three traditional methods of public finance. Uh, for war, we might add a fourth one in there as well, uh, which would be confiscation. Um, that does happen in wartime. Uh, you know, sort of private wealth is confiscated in order to support the public war effort. Um, I won't talk too much about that, though. Um, uh, I'll focus more on the, the three more systematic types of finance, but it's, it's worth mentioning just as, a, as an aside. Um, and usually governments are, are engaged in a sort of a complex combination of these three major methods of finance. It's very rare in the modern era to find governments uh, relying on one or even uh, two of these methods exclusively. Usually they're, they're uh, using all three together. Right? 
And one important reason why it's important to, to talk about these different methods is to understand sort of the logic of public finance and how this plays out in wartime. Because as it turns out, each of the major methods of finance creates its own types of problems and pushes governments to try the other methods, right? And then those methods in turn create their own problems. And so governments are, are constantly shifting their focus back and forth between these different methods, okay? Um, so there's a logic to how this works. And usually it starts with taxation, right? Um, again, this is true in peacetime and wartime. Taxation is just a, a defining characteristic uh, of the modern state. Um, but taxation is also a very difficult method of war finance because it's very, very unpopular, even when there's a sort of an extensive moral support for the war that's being waged. Um, as a general rule, once people start feeling uh, the effects of war on their own pocketbooks, um, their support for it and sort of national morale tends to plummet very, very quickly, right? Um, so taxation, it, it tends to be very, very unpopular, even if there's a more widespread uh, support for the war effort. And uh, this explains, by the way, one reason why, uh, for instance, in the US in 1943, the wage withholding tax was introduced. Uh, up to that point, generally speaking, when people paid taxes, uh, they would, you know, on March 15th every year, they would just have to, to pony up whatever they owed the government that year. And that means that uh, throughout the, the previous year, they had to be wary of their tax bill. They had to have the money on hand, right? And that meant that on tax day, everybody really felt the pressure and everybody was, you know, kind of upset about uh, having to, to, to fork over some of the hard earned, right? Um, but when the wage withholding tax was introduced, um, suddenly that problem went away because with the withholding tax, you never actually get the money, right? It's just a number that's on your paycheck. Um, and so you don't actually uh, feel, um, you don't end up getting as angry about it um, because you feel like it was never really your money in the first place. And then when you get like a tax refund, you actually feel like you've been given something. Um, uh, but this is one reason why that uh, particular form of tax was introduced because um, it provides a, a, a more effective way to uh, uh, encourage people to accept higher and higher tax rates. Okay? Um, anyway, the, uh, the, the point of this is that um, any country's population is going to have some fairly strict limits onto the, the ultimate amount of tax uh, they're willing to accept. And so governments are always on the lookout for alternative methods as well. Right? So when taxation uh, proves insufficient, as it uh, very often does very quickly, uh, governments turn to borrowing, right? which is a very obvious choice, very popular choice among governments, for the simple reason that uh, borrowing seems like it's costless to governments, right? um, particularly um, if sort of maybe more long-term debt that current political parties might not have to repay themselves. Um, it feels like borrowing is just sort of like free money that you get. Right? Um, so governments turn to this very quickly, but of course borrowing has its own limitations, right? You can't just borrow enormous amounts of money forever, right? Eventually they have to be repaid, and there are all kinds of problems with debt repayment during wartime that countries can experience. Um, if you lose the war, or if you're losing, um, you become a very bad credit risk, people don't want to lend to you. Um, if your tax base is destroyed by the conflict, again, you become a, a, a poor credit risk. Um, and there are all kinds of other reasons as well. The International Division of Labor comes in once again. Um, if, uh, for instance, if the people who specialize in finance happen to be uh, living within uh, belligerent nations on the other side of the conflict, obviously they're not going to lend money to you. So uh, by disrupting the International Division of Labor, you also disrupt your ability uh, uh, to wage war, things like this. Okay? So anyway, borrowing has tons of limitations as well. Um, and so eventually governments turn to that uh, time-tested uh, method of war finance, which is inflation. Right? Once again, inflation tends to be very uh, popular with governments because you don't see the negative effects of it right away. They usually only emerge slowly over time as, uh, as prices adjust. Um, and I will talk about more, uh, more about this in, in some detail in a minute. Um, but for now, I just want to point out that um, each of these methods has its limitations, and each of these methods causes problems, right? Especially in the public eye, right? And that's what really matters um, in this uh, situation, because governments have to keep their people happy. Um, they have to keep morale high. They have to keep people um, supporting the war effort, um, and they can't do that if any of these methods gets out of control and people really start to to realize that their uh, their their wealth um, is being eaten up by the conflict. Okay. So governments are, are usually engaged in this very complicated dance um, where they're trying to, to balance out each of these methods and not cause too much economic havoc on their own soil. 
And uh, as I said, again, there is this logic as to how one problem leads to another, right? You become a bad credit risk, so people don't want to lend to you. So in response, you try to raise taxes again to try and pay off some of the debt so that you can borrow more, something like this. Um, and so you go from one method to the other, right? Um, I think it was Yoda who was saying that you know taxation leads to borrowing, and borrowing leads to inflation, and inflation leads to suffering. That's the sort of thing that we're talking about here. Okay? So anyway, you, you can't you can't do this forever. Um, nevertheless, uh, wars do they are financed, and they they do break out. And once the the real conflict shows up. Uh, countries need to mobilize, right? And war mobilization is kind of at the heart um, of the, the many, many problems with the wartime economy, right? So war mobilization is going to mean that land, labor, and capital, um, so all the factors of production, are going to be redirected en masse from their ordinary peacetime uses to production for to support the war effort, okay? And there are two effects that are worth uh, talking about here, sort of one minor, one major. Uh, the minor one is that for war mobilization to work, um, you're going to have a lot of factors of production um, in the, the lower stages of production, especially lower stage capital goods. Those are going to be shifted um, from producing consumer goods to producing war goods, right? And so other things equal, you know, with a, a decline of uh, uh, consumer goods production, living standards are also going to fall, right? So this is one uh, very short-term way that war mobilization can, uh, can uh, bring about problems for ordinary consumers. Um, but there's a second and actually more uh, profound effect uh, that war has uh, on the structure, uh, structure of production. Um, and that is that once war mobilization sets in, resources are going to be systematically shifted uh, away from those higher stages of production uh, that tend to produce uh, usually highly specialized capital goods. And they're going to be moved more towards the, the lower stages that, it, that produce um, uh, again, consumer goods and war goods and things that can, can actually drive the war effort. Um, the reason for this systematic shift is that uh, mobilizing for war requires lots and lots of resources right now. Right? Um, there's that famous line that's attributed to Napoleon that the army marches on its stomach. That's what we're sort of talking about here, right? Uh, Mises has a great line where he says, uh, war can only be waged with present goods, right? Um, and that's what we're doing here, right? You can't send soldiers into battle with, uh, you know, future rifles or something like that, right? You need all of, you know, the, the, the arms and the ammunition and the tanks and guns and planes and so forth. You need all of that right now, right? So war mobilization is going to cause a systematic shift toward the production um, of these kinds of present goods. Um, what's going on in the, the structure of production further up is that you're going to have a couple of uh, different types of capital goods. And some of those capital goods are going to be um, very highly specialized. So, you, for instance, um, very high up in the structure of production, you're going to have uh, capital goods um, that produce highly specialized, uh, 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 other highly specialized capital goods, uh, things like maybe drilling or mining equipment, exploratory equipment. Um, highly specialized, very expensive goods um, that really don't have much use in supporting the war effort. In particular, their um, capital goods are heterogeneous, as we've talked about, and these kinds of capital goods are not going to be easily converted into you know, assembly lines for making ammunition or something like that. So these types of uh, higher stage, highly specialized capital goods are usually just sort of let, uh, left to rust. Um, while the uh, the war effort is going on, they tend to be underused and they tend not to be replaced, right? Because their ordinary peacetime uses um, just aren't, uh, uh, they're not continued during the war effort and so they, they can't justify the expense, okay? So that's the, uh, the inconvertible capital. At the same time, the more convertible capital goods, the ones that are less specialized, tend to be overused, right? Rather than, than underused. Um, overused and misused. Um, a good example of this would be something like uh, um, the American war economy uh, during World War II uh, when you had um, factories that were normally producing consumer goods but they were converted over to, to support the war effort and that were running on like double and triple shifts, right? Sometimes running 24 hours a day producing um, all kinds of uh, Goods that could be used, uh, you know, for the for the troops or you know tanks and planes and weapons and that sort of stuff. Okay, so these kinds of uh, 
capital goods tend to be very overused, and especially they tend not to be replaced. Uh, entrepreneurs in these war goods industries tend to put off uh, maintaining and repairing and replacing capital as long as they possibly could because they're so focused on this effort uh, of getting present goods into production, right? So they ignore um, the, the market signals that would usually let them know it's time to, to replace these worn out machines. Instead, they just run the factories and the plant and equipment full blast uh, for as long as the war effort goes on. Um, a good example of this would be uh, basically all of the belligerent nations, but especially uh, Germany and uh, Austria-Hungary during the First World War. Right? Um, it, after the war was ended, um, they realized that uh, uh, the belligerent nations realized that they had actually consumed uh, almost all of their, their capital stock during the war. Um, and and this, uh, this idea of capital consumption um, during the war effort is, is maybe, I mean, it's one of the most important factors for understanding how the wartime economy works. Right? Um, so systematic capital consumption is, is the major danger here. And uh, I think it's, we, we've talked already this week a little bit about why that would be important because maintaining the capital stock, coordinating it is, you know, the single most important factor in terms of uh, maintaining and increasing our standards of living, right? So without that capital stock, once it's not replaced, uh, eventually standards of living are, are bound to fall, um, as indeed they did during and after these wars, okay? Um, and also I'll say that uh, this is one, um, it's a good place to emphasize how important economics is as a lens through which to view some of these problems because it's economics that allows us to see things like the dangers of capital uh, consumption during wartime. Um, it's economics that lets us really assess all of the costs of war, the true costs of war, um, not just um, say, uh, I mean, you know, we know about the human costs of war, that's horrific enough. We know that war is physically destructive, um, but economics lets us see that it's also destructive um, very profoundly, uh, very destructive effects on society as well. Okay? And here's another couple, uh, couple of quotes, um, but the most important one, no country has ever profited from protracted warfare. That's the punchline um, to this particular section. Now, um, to talk about the inflationary issues a little bit more, because they're very important, um, one obvious question that you could ask is, okay, so if capital is consumed in wartime, if living standards are just going to, to plummet, how is it that wars ever happen to begin with, right? Why isn't there just some sort of crisis that sets in once mobilization happens? Why don't people immediately just get sick of it? Or, you know, what stops the economy from just sort of, you know, tanking right away and the, the conflict uh, from ever getting started to begin with? Um, and this is where the inflationary issue comes back in, because inflation ends up explaining a lot of this much bigger economic and political process that war sets in motion, uh, and in particular plays a really important role in uh, keeping conflicts going by creating the illusion uh, of wartime prosperity. Right? Um, I've already said uh, before that you know taxation is a very limited method um, of war finance because even under a system of very heavy taxation, uh, consumers and entrepreneurs um, they can still see fairly clearly what's happening in the economy, right? They know that they're being taxed. They know that their wealth is declining. They know that there's not much incentive to, to keep up with the, the peacetime production that they were engaging with. And so they can, uh, if, if governments tried to prosecute a war, uh, based purely on taxation, um, people would very quickly catch on, realize that the economy was in trouble, and um, would put a stop to it. So governments are very keen on finding a way to disguise the costs of war. Uh, and so this is where inflation uh, comes in. So I think you know most of this uh, story you probably uh, uh, have either heard or can guess. Um, we have already heard about how um, expansions in the money supply um, do not cause uh, an instantaneous rise in prices everywhere in the economy, right? Likewise, the purchasing power of money doesn't just fall, you know, like a, like a rock systematically throughout the economy when the money supply is increased. There's a step-by-step -step process uh, that takes place, right? And this step-by-step -step process explains how governments can use inflationary war finance uh, to conceal the costs of war and to even convince people that war breeds prosperity rather than being uh, a burden on the economy. Um, so basically what happens uh, is that um, new money is created, it's spent on war goods, which triggers a sort of a boom, similar to the Austrian business cycle theory, not exactly the same, but similar. Um, and 
monetary expansion causes you know an increases uh, an increase in uh, all the the uh, nominal uh, prices and profits and wages um, in the war industries and it usually gives a bit of a boost to the national stock market as well right so there's a, an appearance of prosperity um, but the war goods industries, uh, you know, the, the so-called merchants of death, they benefit from this monetary expansion in at least two ways. First, uh, they, of course, they get a, a massive increase in demand for their services because of all the government orders that they're filling um, for the tanks and the planes and the, you know, the uh, technology R&D and that sort of thing that the war effort requires. But they benefit in a second and subtler way as well, which is the war goods industries end up being the first receivers of the new money that's being created. So in other words, they receive that new money before prices have had time to rise elsewhere in the economy. And what that means is that wealth is actually being redistributed to them from those late receivers, right? So that's a, another um, subtler, uh, unseen effect um, of inflationary war finance, okay? Um, in any case, uh, price, these price changes eventually they sort of ripple upward through the economy. Um, through the structure of production, they give the illusion of prosperity. Um, entrepreneurs um, are still using their older methods uh, of, uh, of capital accounting, so they're not taking account of all these relative price changes that are that are going on. This this inflationary process that's been set in motion, and because of that, they don't uh, they can't accurately depreciate their capital. They don't understand. They think it's increasing in value, uh, whereas in fact they're actually consuming it. Right. So once again, we have uh, inflationary finance concealing um, the the true costs of engaging in this conflict. Um, and once again, uh, here's a nice one from Mises. One can say without exaggeration that inflation is an indispensable means of militarism. Without it, the repercussions of war on welfare become obvious much more quickly and penetratingly, war weariness would set in much earlier. Right? So you can see that this is a very powerful political tool um, for keeping uh, not only a conflict going, but also sort of uh, national morale uh, as well. Um, however, uh, the negative effects of war don't stop there. Um, there are also some broader uh, political economic implications that are uh, worth touching on uh, quickly. And the most important one of these um, is, again, uh, uh, this question of uh, economic control or laissez-faire. And it happens that um, in the wartime economy, the longer a war wears on, uh, the greater the economic problems uh, uh, that a country experiences, and also the greater the degree of uh, government control over the economy uh, becomes. Um, this happens through, a, again, a sort of a step-by-step -step process. Um, and Mises describes this uh, in a very nice short essay uh, that you may have read called Middle of the Road Policy Leads to Socialism. Um, if you want a very uh, sad real world example um, of this process playing out exactly as Mises described it, um, you just have to look at uh, Venezuela for the uh, past few years, which is currently experiencing this. Um, but what, uh, just to sort of briefly summarize it, um, there's a sort of a logic to economic policy failures, right? Governments uh, during, uh, in peacetime and wartime, but especially in wartime, are always trying to recover uh, from the negative effects of their last round of economic controls. Um, they're constantly pushing themselves to uh, expand their control over the economy in order to, uh, to stop problems that their previous policies created, right? And uh, the, the cumulative effect of all this is that if the war goes on long enough, eventually you end up with a, a very wide-ranging uh, government control over the economy. Um, particularly, this happens through price controls because price controls cause shortages and they, they drive out certain entrepreneurs from the market. So governments want to uh, keep those entrepreneurs in the market. So in order to do that, they establish new price controls uh, and then the process just sort of repeats itself. Um, whereas... Uh, and it's all part of an effort to basically keep prices from rising. That, that's the government's uh, major policy goal during wartime usually, because prices will eventually have to rise due to shortages, due to uh, destruction from the actual conflict, inflationary policy. Prices are always, uh, they're, they're bound to rise sooner or later. So governments need to find a way uh, to stop this. Um, and they do this through uh, you know, an ever-increasing um, range uh, of price controls. And so finally, what you end up with is what uh, Mises called um, socialism of the German pattern, uh, or simply uh, fascism uh, for short, um, or war socialism. Um, the idea that 
uh, in order to support the war effort, government eventually has to take control over almost all of the factors of production in the economy, while leaving in place uh, the sort of nominal system of property rights, freedom of contract, freedom of exchange, and so forth, right? These are not abolished. Um, in fact, they're often invoked even more uh, in wartime uh, than they are in peacetime, um, but they only exist on paper, right? And this is what happens. Again, this is the story of both world wars and almost all um, of the belligerents in those conflicts, right? Um, there's also a, a much... <coughs> Uh, sort of a, a bigger picture view um, of government control that's captured in this idea of the ratchet effect, which is an idea that uh, Bob Higgs talks about quite a lot in his book, Crisis and Leviathan. If you haven't read that, it's an amazing book. Uh, you, you must read it. Um, but what Higgs talks about uh, when he discusses the ratchet effect is this cumulative growth of government power uh, that the war-making process sets in motion. Because once wars start, governments immediately uh, arrogate to themselves um, enormous uh, uh, wartime powers, uh, economic controls, social controls, and so forth. And um, usually these powers uh, decrease to some extent after the crisis is over. Government does hand some of them back. But there's always some that remain, um, even if they're just uh, little precedents for taking control over the economy during a time of crisis. Um, the damage has already been done. So the cumulative effect of this is that government control over the economy tends to grow over time. It grows by leaps and bounds during a crisis, especially during a war, and then it comes back down afterwards, even if it takes a few years. But it never quite get, gets back down to that level that it was before the crisis. So, over time, through many conflicts, through many wars, uh, the power of, uh, you know, the control of government has over the economy tends to increase, right, like a ratchet. And, you know, there are all kinds of implications uh, for this sort of thing for, uh, uh, for things like political philosophy as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about those, but uh, you can sum them up pretty much in that uh, the, the brilliant uh, saying of Randolph Bourne that war is the health of the state, right? Um, if you understand that, um, then you understand most of the, uh, the philosophical implications of uh, these kinds of conflicts. Mises put it best, uh, as always, in the long run, war and the preservation of the market economy are incompatible, right? Governments always face this choice. They could always stop their control, they could always take a step back, return toward the market economy, but doing that would acquaint people very rapidly with the true costs of war um, that are being paid uh, both domestically as well as on the battlefield, right? And governments are loath to do this, so uh, almost inevitably, uh, their decisions tend to go in the opposite direction toward increasing control, right? And the result is that the market economy simply cannot last uh, under wartime conditions. So, um, if we can talk, if economics can tell us something about how wars are waged, can it tell us anything about how we could, they could be stopped um, and how we might prevent them in the future? Again, I think the answer is yes. Um, but as Mises would point out, um, this is uh, an ideological question and it's an institutional question. But the basic point to make, to return to what I was saying at the beginning, is that war is purposeful. So, what that means is that in order to stop it, we have to eliminate, uh, we have to uh, find its purposes, its motivations, and we need to eliminate them. Uh, or as Misa said, we need to eliminate the conditions that make war possible, that make it sort of desirable and profitable for some of those people who engage in it, right? And ideologically speaking, what that means is that we have to sort of replace an ideology of, of war, of autarky, of, of nationalism, um, with a philosophy of peace and of commercialism. Uh, and this philosophy is exemplified in the work of people like Richard Cobden and John Bright, who were the, you know, the, the leaders of the, uh, the most prominent Manchester liberals, um, who Mises uh, himself you know, considered sort of forerunners of, uh, of his own uh, liberalism. And what they recognized is that human beings just, they have not yet developed a more effective way of encouraging social cooperation and avoiding conflict um, than by peacefully exchanging with each other, right? The active exchange uh, is uh, uh, an expression of, of mutual reliance and, and respect, right? In trade, you acknowledge that somebody uh, benefits you um, and that you benefit another person and that everybody depends on this, this mutual ability, right? Once you admit that, uh, conflict, sort of, you know, arbitrary uh, discrimination and conflict become very difficult, uh, if not impossible, especially on the large scale that leads to war, right? Uh, bottom line is that trade builds social bonds, 
So the key, not just to liberalism, but just to at the economics of war uh, in general, is understanding that people, uh, the individuals, are not inherently in conflict with each other. Our, our interests are powerfully aligned, right? Um, this is something that uh, economists have been teaching for, uh, for centuries, right? Uh, one person's success does not require another person's failure. Um, but it's, it's the most warlike ideologies in history um, that have taught that, right? have um, denied uh, the mutually beneficial nature of exchange and of, of human cooperation um, and tried to substitute for it um, some kind of philosophy of conflict, right? Whatever it might be, whether it's mercantilism uh, or the Marxist variety of class theory or nationalism or racist ideologies or whatever. It should come as no surprise that people who are under the sway of these ideologies tend to see conflict and war as inevitable um, or even as very good things. Right? Uh, but in sharp contrast, it's, uh, it's, it's the idea of, of Mises um, and the liberals uh, that show us that war is not inevitable um, and that whatever else it might be, um, it's certainly not a path uh, to prosperity. Um, so with that, I'll say uh, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to talking to you in office hours. <laughs> <laughs>